Welcome to Life Changing Challengers, the podcast where passion meets purpose. I'm Brad Minus, your host, guiding you through stories of transformation and triumph from endurance feats to overcoming adversity. Our guests defy the limits and inspire action. Ready to ignite your desire and incinerate your barriers? Join us. Your journey to the extraordinary begins now. All right. And thank you for joining us on another episode of Life Changing Challengers. I'm so humbled and honored to have Meredith Alexander and Skylar with us today. Very amazing woman who is a a shining beacon in this world. Both of them are just like amazingly positive incredible people. And so Meredith is, uh, owns the Grit Mindset Academy, and we'll go into that a little bit later. She's written two books. The first one is called The Sky is the Limit. The second one is 100 Days of Epic. And just really excited to have you both with me today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Thank you so much for having us. We are super excited to be here. And hello to your anybody who's listening out there. We are honored to have you here. Uh, do you see what I'm talking about? Do you see what I'm talking about? Do you see how the positivity just radiates off these women? It's amazing. It's amazing. So, all right. So, you know what? I literally start off the same way because I really love to have the audience have a good connection. So, Meredith, can you tell us a little, little bit about how you grew up? What was your family compliment like? What was the environment where you grew up? And tell us a little about your childhood. So I was the only child, and just as here in Tampa, there are many military brats, I was what you might call an entertainment brat, because both of my parents were in the entertainment industry. My father ran one of the big amphitheaters in upstate New York when I was growing up. My mom was on tour as a singer. So... I actually grew up surrounded by some of the celebrities. I, when I was a little girl, I mean, we're talking, I am going to date myself, but you know, everyone from like Jim Morrison of the Doors before he died, Janis Joplin, Bobby Sherman, if you were back into the little teeny boppy things, Frank Sinatra, you name it. But my passion ended up being the New York City Ballet. And so I was convinced that I was going to be a principal ballerina with the New York City Ballet. That was my dream. I was dancing every spare moment. I was also really good in school, but I was one of those that was like, yeah, okay, whatever. I'd rather be dancing. And so I was on the real fast track for it. I was in New York City Ballet's nutcracker when I was little and was a child, one of the children, a candy cane and in their production of Firebird. So it really looked like I was on my way. And then when I was about 13 or 14, some cracks started developing. My parents announced to me that they were getting a divorce. And so it was a little bit of a tug of war of where was I going to live with whom? How was I going to spend my time? So one great path of least resistance seemed to be, how about prep school? And so I was not particularly fond of the idea, but I did have some friends were going who, so I thought maybe the adults in my life were saying, oh, yes, if you were talented academically, you do not want to be a ballet dancer. And yet I had this little voice inside of me that said, no, this is who you were meant to be. So I walked in to my beloved ballet teacher's audition for her spring production. And kind of everybody knew that this was kind of just a formality because clearly I was going to be cast in the role of the little match girl, and which was the leading role. And so I start the audition, and shockingly, my beloved ballet teacher would not look at me. It was as if I was invisible, and it was so noticeable 
that when I went back into the dressing room, all my little friends were saying, what was up with Miss Marlene? She wouldn't even look at you. And so, of course, I'm getting back into the car with my mom. How did it go? Fine. Uh, What do you think? Yeah, it was fine. And so that moment of real first kind of shock and transformation came the next week when I got back. And as I saw my friends looking at the cast list on the bulletin board and then saw their expressions on their face when they looked at me, and it's that horrible look when people don't know what to say to you. So not only was I not cast as the little match girl, but I ended up in the court of ballet with all the little girls. And so what, yes. So what that meant to me was that not only had I humiliated myself and failed at this, but that horrible little voice that had been so certain that had, to my knowledge, never led me astray, could never be trusted again because that was the source of clearly, I the way other people saw me was not how I saw myself. And so... I, that was the last ballet I ever did. I agreed to go to prep school. I went on to prep school and continued with my life. I went to, I hated prep school initially as a child. It was incredibly high pressure, but I did really well. I finally worked my way to the point where even in English class, I was awarded one of five A's that this one professor had given in 30 years. And so I thought, oh my gosh, okay, well, maybe I can be a, I can be a writer. I love to write. I can be a writer. And so I go to Georgetown and I get enrolled in honors English class. And of course she asked for a sample of our writing. And I'm like, here, write my A paper. And I get it back the exact same paper, C plus over D minus. And that was it. That was finally like, okay, the moment I'm starting to like think, okay, maybe I can trust this little voice uh, after all, that was the total shutdown. So from there, that really shaped me for decades of my life going forward where I said, you know what? I'm not going to chase a dream, I'm just going to chase a living because that seems to be the way to do it. However, I couldn't help but notice that as great as my education was, it wasn't teaching us how to choose to live. And so that's when I first encountered Plato, Socrates, the Stoics. And it was as if a part of me came alive in that moment. And that became the through line that kind of laced through all the other bits of my life and led me to study Aikido, study energy, study Tai Chi, and really, and Eastern philosophy. And I even traveled around and lived out of my truck exploring Canada for about nine months at one point until finally, lo and behold, I ended it back in New York and met Skylar's father, who was my Aikido <laughs> instructor. And uh, that's where Eric Howell uh, would be. You say? <laughs> yes, indeed. And so... Skylar's evolution is it's actually a fascinating story in that my I am born on July 4th, which is somewhat of a holiday. A little bit. <laughs> Skylar has only heard the story like thousands of millions of times. So my mom made a passing comment that, oh, wouldn't it be remarkable because the babies do date the first baby, not Skylar was early January. Wouldn't it be amazing if your child was born on Christmas? Well, I kind of perk up and go, 
that is a fabulous idea. So I walk around telling everybody, the OBGYN, the policeman on the corner, <laughs> I'm born on July 4th, so my baby is going to be born on Christmas. And of course, people are kind of patting me on my head going like, sure he is. Well, lo and behold, to the music of the Star Trek Enterprise, boom, my water breaks. And my first child is truly born on Christmas. So fast forward to my second pregnancy. Well, the due date is in early April. And I say, oh my gosh, holiday. oh, April Fool's Day because I'm born on July 4th. And now my son is born on Christmas. So once again, I walk around telling everybody my OBGYN, the lady who does the laundry. I'm like, yep. So that's when they're coming. And of course, they're like, mm hmm. However, their father did not want to know the sex of this child. So I went through the whole charade of pretending to pick out a boy's name when I knew it was going to be a girl. Well, as it so happened, I have an uncle, wait for it, Skyler, who was born on April Fool's Day. And I was so sure that this baby would be born on April Fool's Day. That I said, if it's a boy, it's going to be Skylar. Well, sure enough, my other daughter was born on April Fool's Day. And lo and behold, we have a surprise guest showing up on the menu. That's a third <laughs> child. A third child because I, of course, am going, well, of course, we left a name in the universe. We left the name Skylar. So boy or girl, this child is going to be named Skylar. And by the way, he or she will be born on Memorial Day. <laughs> Boom! What is your birthday, Skyler? <laughs> oh. So I know. So oh, awesome. You're just time. about. So yeah, that's right around the corner. So it's like so you're going to be thirty-one. Yeah, very good. Yes. Oh, great! So so Lyndon is born on December twenty-fifth. Correct. Yeah. And is it Shada? Saya. Saya. And Saya is born on April Fool's Day. Yeah. And Skylar is born on Memorial Day. Correct. Yes. Wow. That's Your crazy. Is day. Yes. You yeah. know what? It, it, it's amazing. I don't, I've never done an episode just on myself. So I try to sprinkle little things in here. And I've, and usually what it is, what, how it comes out is comparisons with my guests. So I'm just going to tell you right now. And a lot of people don't even know about me because I put this away. But I, in high school, I started ballet, tap, and jazz. And I ended up doing it for 12 years. And I, I was in New York for a little while. Mostly, most of the time it was Chicago where I grew up doing musical theater, dan uh, dance shows, the whole bit, just like you. When I got here to Florida, I had been in the military for a while and I got here to Florida. And right after my second tour in the military, I got agents out here and I performed at the Straws. I performed at yeah, different spots. So I'm there with you on, I'm totally there with you on that. So we have that in common. And yeah, so, so uh, yeah. Cool. So, say again. Was the question. Oh, I was. I've been in numerous ones. I actually, pers I actually, I actually was better in studio theater than I was mm -hmm. in musical theater. But I've done, God, I've done cabaret. I've done, I've done Jekyll and Hyde like three times. Yeah. Showboat, Damn Yankees. I did Damn, Damn Yankees at the Straws. Twice. Oh. oh, yeah. See? So, <laughs> there. Yeah. Hey? and then I also had performed with the Spanish Lyric Opera, and we did a, we did a, a Spanish opera. I forgot what they called it, but they did. It. But so that was cool. So, yeah, I'm right there with you and realized that I did some semi pro stuff, but it never, but again, whenever I tried for the big stuff, I got yeah. the same reaction. So, yeah. you know. So is a footnote to my ballet story is I, and this is to anyone who is listening, who has been very quick to squash their own dreams and who has really taken one failure or even two failures and not been willing to give themselves kind of a thousand second chances, I found out in my 50s, after I really had gone through decades distrusting 
that little voice. I happened to mention to my mom in passing the whole little match girl trauma for me. Because for me, that was trauma. This yeah. was like my dream getting ripped away. And and she got this really strange look on her face. And what she revealed to me is that my father had just been really late on paying my ballet teacher the bill because he didn't see the point of me taking dance anymore if we would be going to boarding school. Yes. And so she was frustrated and decided that she could not give me the leading role if my if the bill hadn't been paid. So I went through my entire life believing that it was me when really it was circumstances that had zero to do with me. And so if anyone is listening at this point and has been assuming the worst and really convincing themselves to play small because of something that was out of their control, I would really encourage you to rem remember our story and use that dream, even if you had like a failure, quote unquote, in your past, to use it really as a reminder of what a capacity to dream you actually have and to ensure that as you go forward in your second, your third, your fourth, your fifth, your sixth, your 100th attempt, that you stay true to the belief that one of these is going to pop and that you learn from each of these and you grow from each of these. Yeah. Failure is not the end. It's a yeah. learning experience. And you actually can't succeed without failure because you can't learn unless you fail. So failure is a stepping stone. Exactly. It's not the end. And it's a yeah. necessary part of the recipe because if you look at Virtually anyone who is considered a huge success story, they, the process is the moments where it's not working, course correct. It's not working, course correct. It's not working, course correct. Iterate, look again, reassess, evaluate. And do they have any more luck than any of the rest of us? No. Do they have any more connections? Not usually. It's usually that perseverance. And that commitment simply to keep going and not give up. I have a belief that epic, right, which is my thing, epic is simply when your desire to create a miracle is greater than your desire to give in. That's a that's beautiful. It's powerful. It's powerful. I got one more little I got one little more comparison between the two when I was twelve. I started Taekwondo and Aikido. We'll just stop with that. So that's what I'm saying. We, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of similarities between our lives. So. Can I ask a question? Of course. And, and when Ren plays the characters, a lot of the job, the whole cast is like a character. What was your character? What was your in Ren? Oh, in Rent, uh, I was course. Yeah, I was course dancer. Course. I was just a course dancer. So, yeah, yeah. but I would have, I wanted to play Roger more than anything in the world. <laughs> yeah. That's not so, yeah, it hadn't even worked. Yeah, I mean, I like Mark, but actually, Roger's more, Ma Roger's a, a baritone. So Roger, it's bar baritone tenor. So I could hit those notes. I Mark is more of a, a high tenor. So I could hit some of those notes. Even if I, I wanted to. My very first crush, Adam oh. Pascal. <laughs> Adam Pascal. I saw the very first time I saw Rent with the original cast, and I was oh, this it gets even better because <laughs> I didn't think we were going to see it. But Rent is the first set of the first play that they put on where they did what they called Rent Rush, where you go in like five o'clock before the eight o'clock curtain and you get in line and you get a raffle ticket and if you win and if you get chosen they raffle off the front row now at the at the nether at the netherlander theater 
wow. six in a row is not actually the greatest of seats. Right. Because you're kind of looking up like this, right? Yeah. It's not the greatest seats. It's still they're still good. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I ended we get, I ended up getting a pair of tickets. Oh, wow. And I literally I could have reached up and touched their toes at when they were on the edge of the screen. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was totally on a whim and it was cold. And it was, but we're like, oh, we're going to, we're going to find out. We at least got to try. We at least got to try because you couldn't get tickets. I mean, it was just no way. I mean, you're talking about, you're talking about Adam Pascal and I mean, and all of them, they were just in, they were just amazing. And I'm losing, I totally blanked out where there's the rest of them, but I usually can rattle them off like this. So, but yeah, so, but anyway, yeah. Anthony Rapp, the guy that plays on, on the irrefutable new program that was also in Law and Order Forever, Jesse Jesse, not Jesse Spencer. Jesse Owens. Jesse no, Owens. no, not Jenny. Jesse Owens. But you will okay. figure it out. We will yeah. figure it out. Warren Broward. So, if you're listening to this podcast, we want you to put in the comments who is it that we can't think exactly. of exactly right, 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 right now. I've so. got lots of a funny story on the way to my high school. We were singing La Ba When. And it's the opera that my friend's based on. And then my, uh, you just a couple of friends I went to Sinchi instead of doing the Irish short song that everyone went to. And Tay Diggs, he walked in. Tay Diggs? <laughs> yes. <laughs> It was so cool. Oh my God. We had never seen one. But I was a Linda. <laughs> oh, but Lava Women is great. I have a friend who still lives in New York. She studied at the Manhattan School of Op- of Music, and he played in. And I used to go to New York all the time to go watch him because he was at he was at the Lincoln Center and he was performing with the with the New York City Opera. So I saw him play in La Bohème, and La Bohème is amazing, absolutely yeah. amazing. But nothing like La Vie Bohème. It's a little bit better than that. But anyway, God, we could talk about this stuff forever, and I bet you people are <laughs> kick out of it. Even though we're letting this go, I'm sure people are going to get a kick out of it. They usually yeah. do. So okay, you had, you, you had Skylar, and where are you living at this point? So at this point, where we were living in Tampa, so okay. we moved here to. Tampa after living in New York City, which is where my oldest son was born. And so now we're here in Tampa and Skylar's middle name, because her dad was Japanese. So her middle name literally means happiness in Japanese. It is Sachi. And so we were here and Sky was fearless from the outset. I mean, by the time (laughs) <laughs> she was like five years old. She had broken both arms twice. So at least she was fair. She was a monk and bar queen. And the only problem is that every now and then they got wet, which, and fortunately I was never with her or maybe unfortunately. <laughs> when she broke her arm, I don't know, we'd get the call. And sometimes it would be 26 voice messages from my mom going, Meredith, where are you? Can you like when I would be at a conference out of town or it would just be the Montessori like Miss Meredith. I'm <laughs> so sorry to tell you. <laughs> but I think Sky we're having <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> I will let you know great to the orthopedic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't yeah. even I can't even imagine. And uh, did you have the same orthopedist that saw her every single time? Oh, yes. And, in, <laughs> and I we had like gone through all the cute little designs that were available for the cast. I mean, the, the bright colors, the tie dye, the teddy bear. They did. Oh, that was right. They were out of it. That's I, a big disappointment. Almost worth going for number five. But I had to cut her off. At some point, I was like, no, this. Yeah, uh, Skylar, this is starting to get a little expensive. But now that I'm thinking about it, we should like, we should go over to the Coast Guard place over here and tell them that they have to rename a ship and call it the SS Arakawa. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> For sure. But, you know, Sky outside was fearless, not only physically, 
But also just she, we had a turning point where I actually, her dad and I were no, no longer together. And I found myself in an abusive relationship. In fact, abusive relationship, number one of two, thank you very much. Another lesson to your viewers that you can definitely overcome that. It, and that's a whole nother topic here, but it is one that should ultimately end up being empowering to you as you get beyond it. But it gave me the opportunity because I was still very much, it drew me back into learning how some people dealt with formidable challenges and emerged as bigger, bolder versions of themselves while some people were absolutely crushed. And so it was that really immersion back into the the differentiating factor was always the inner game. It was always came back to the inner game. And so I went kind of back to that root of the Eastern medicine, the Aikido, all that. And I had a conversation with Skylar after one really kind of uncomfortable moment with this one particular man and really reinforced to her that just because people are quote unquote grown up doesn't mean that they don't have their own challenges and their own issues and that their issues are a reflection on you. And it was like an unfolding for her because at this point, I really started listening to a lot of Abraham Hicks, uh, Esther Hicks. Esther Hicks, yeah. Abraham Hicks. Yeah. I became a huge fan. And so it was really in that moment where Skylar blossomed as a human being and became a total yes girl. She really wanted to keep up with her older brother and sister incredibly smart <laughs> and so she ended up just going academically and until ultimately she ended up at Yale her first venture <laughs> abroad one is mom I think I have a great idea for spring vacation I think I'm going to go to Tanzania I was like oh okay so is there a group with Yale that is going to Tanzania. No, I just think I would, I, I think it'd be a fun place to go. So I found a place called Art in Tanzania and yeah, I'm going to go by myself. <laughs> and I was, so that became the beginning of Sky doing these epic <laughs> visiting right out of the seven continents, um, teaching English to monks in Nepal, going to Ecuador, going to Croatia, all kinds of things. I mean, I literally, without exaggeration, can say that she positively impacted the world by the time she was 22, more than most people do by the time that they were in their whole lives. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So can I ask just before we, we delve into some of this? About about Lyndon and Saya, what do they oh, do, yeah. and where are they right oh, now? Gosh. So Lyndon and uh, so I called him as a little boy Ryu because that was, and the, when he was little, he wanted nothing to do than with the name of Lyndon. Ryu is his middle name. Ryu is technically his middle name, and so Ryu was a dynamo. He set the bar really high for his sisters. Also, incredibly brilliant. He was the rock, the solid rock of our family. He was amazing. And so not only was he smart, but he was very athletic. He ended up being one of the stars of his lacrosse team in college. And then he went on after college to be one of Tampa Bay's 30 under 30, working with one of the major accounting firms here. And then so now he has moved on. He's midway through his 30s and he's chief financial officer of a big organization yeah so he's doing fantastically and then then oh, at first he's just there. halfway through his 30s he's already in the c-suite i know yes crazy. yes indeed and and 
her older sister is a force to be reckoned with as well. She is moving up the ranks of NBC, doing really well. Saya has two little boys. Ryu has one. And then, of course, family to be continued. So they are both doing, they're both doing really remarkable things. And I will say that they also, after the boulder fell, they just have been incredible siblings to Skylar. I mean, Saya, for example, while working, living in Orlando, every single weekend, every single weekend, with the exception of her now husband's birthday weekend, every single weekend for an entire year, uninterrupted, she came on Friday to Miami. to visit either to Miami or over to Tampa. Tampa. And she lived on the far side of Orlando. So it was, that was two and a half hours. Orlando, I, Miami was four. Every single weekend, she made that trek to be at Skylar's side and to give me a little bit of a breather when in those first early days when Sky could literally not be left in a room alone because she couldn't sit up without being in danger of falling. Okay, so, so let's cut that right here before we get, because I really want to start the story and then roll that in because this is a formidable part of this. Can I ask about, just real quick, because you mentioned Tampa and Miami, what was going on in Miami? Sorry, yeah. so that goes into our story. Okay, so, so, let, so we will, so, yeah, so let's uh, continued. Okay, so, so everybody's doing well. Skylar is all over the world. And so she is in Colombia at this point, right? So technically, she's in Peru. One yeah, day ago. Okay. So after you know, I did a postgraduate fellowship trip in Peru. So, so I was supposed to be there for a year. And I've been there for a couple months. And my best friend slash future boss. And I decided to take a vacation to Columbia. And the accident happened on the second to last day. On the so, second to the last day of... Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. There, Columbia. Yes. Okay. So, so the setting is that Sky had completed... So she's on a year-long fellowship. It was broken into four parts. Three, sorry, three parts. So she just completed the first part, come home for Christmas, and on her way headed back down to pick up the second leg, which the woman who was to be the her boss in the second leg was her sister's age and had become her best friend in Peru. So the two of them decided to go down to Columbia and Explore, they've heard that it was wonderful. They had like two weeks, something like that, right? It was a long trip. And she's sending me pictures of her literally rappelling down waterfalls and on these amazing beaches and doing all of these crazy things. And so that literally, yes, the day before she was supposed to return to Peru and pick up her fellowship, she and this young women, woman went on a rafting expedition, whitewater rafting, went through the dangerous part unscathed, and then got to the grotto. And a few hours later is when I got the call. In the middle of a Friday afternoon, February 19, 2016, with Dana on the other end of the call. And at first I'm like, oh, hi, Dana. Yes, how are you? And then it starts, my mind starts going, why is Dana calling me and Skylar's not calling me? And Dana, of course, is still traumatized because she's experienced what just happened. And I said, where's Skylar? And she said, I don't know how to tell you this, but they're... Skylar's been in a terrible accident. And she I remember hearing her mumble something about 
this big boulder, this rock, and it falling on Skylar. And I'm trying to, I, I'm in total denial. I'm trying to hear what she said. And of course, the part of my mind is going, okay, just calm down. This can't, I mean, surely Skylar has like broken her leg and, and this is bad, but it'll be fine. And finally, I get to the moment where I say, well, Skylar's going to be okay, isn't she? And the pause there, where then her friend just said, well, there are three doctors working on her right now, and they can't say, you just need to get down here as soon as possible. And that moment of just putting the phone down and just, of course, at first, just this can't be happening. This can't be happening. We are supposed to have so much more time because, again, I had navigated being a single mom for years and years, thinking that once the kids had gotten to where they were now, that it would be fine. I would be able to breathe and I'd gotten through the worst of the worst. And now we'd have time. I would have time to kind of figure out who I am now. And the kids would go on and they would have all these wonderful things to look forward to. And now all of a sudden it was, oh my gosh, Skylar needs some someone way more than me to be her mom right now. She needs someone who has millions and millions of dollars and who knows how to create a miracle, knows how to navigate these kind of things. And it was a terrifying place to be initially. And so for the first few hours, we're scrambling. But Here's the interesting thing, Brad, one in kind of my shock and realizing that I had zero idea what to do. I didn't even speak Spanish and this had happened in Colombia. All I knew about Colombia was what you would see in the movies, right? And so I put a tiny little post on Facebook, the woman who only posts about rescue puppies and chocolate, put this little tiny post that said, my youngest daughter, I just got a call and my youngest daughter has been seriously injured in Colombia, South America. If anyone has experience with this kind of thing, would you please reach out to me? And this is that is actually the very first post that is in our book, The Sky is the Limit, because ultimately the book, The Sky, the Limit captures all of the posts for the first four months and the whole unfolding. And my phone just started blowing up. People started calling me because, of course, Skylar had friends all over the world and people were reaching out. And there were people who knew people who were from Colombia and had office workers who were from Colombia and this and that. And a few angels kind of evolved in the mix. And a few hours later, Saya and I Ryu was going to stay here in the United States to kind of manage things here. Saya and I were racing to Tampa International only to be turned away by American Airlines, even though we had no luggage to check and we told them the scenario. It was against their policy uh, 45 minutes before the plane was supposed to take off to allow us to go on board. Needless to say, that didn't go over terribly well, especially with my son, but we ended up having him drive us down to Miami. So in the middle of the night, my oldest daughter and I boarded a flight to Bogota and then spent a couple hours in Bogota waiting for another flight that would take us to a town in Colombia that I still cannot pronounce to this day. <laughs> Bucamaguanda or something. And then from there, a four-hour drive to where Skylar was in the hospital in this tiny little town called Socorro. I can't even imagine what was going through your mind and the amount of time that had to go by. The four-hour trip to Miami, then the and the five-hour flight to Bogota, then another four, then another couple hours on another <laughs> flight, then four hours on the, what I can't even imagine 
what was going on. Just that those, oh my, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. I don't even know if I want you to explain it to me. Uh, <laughs> but I do want to ask Skylar, uh, if you don't mind, if, please feel free to say no. But do you, what do you remember? Nothing. Okay. About the day, I don't remember anything. But do you want us to tell you the story of what happened? Oh, of what actually happened? I mean, I think you did a good job, but I would be interested is what is the first thing you remember? I'm sure it's a waking up type of thing, but. Yes. I was in a medically induced coma for a while. So the first thing I remember actually is squeezing my mom's hand one for yes, two for no. Because my mouth was a wire shut. And so, and even after that, I couldn't talk for a while. So I just did one for yes and two for no. <laughs> yeah. So this older had cracked open her skull, crushed her lungs, fractured her spine, fractured both scapulas, snapped her right thigh, and pulverized her left ankle. So medical precedent indicated that basically there were four of her injuries that were virtually assured to be fatal, and clearly they were not. But actually, what was interesting, Brad, for me is that the, that flight became incredibly profound for me because what I realized, first of all, is that resilience, the time to find your resilience, to build your resilience is not after the boulder falls. So what I realized is that this, as I, as the dust kind of settled, the perfect storm of negative emotions, I realized that for me, the most unacceptable emotion that I was feeling out of all of them was feeling powerless to help Skylar. And so that was when I was not willing to not be there for my child. And so I looked back and I realized that this was not the first boulder in my life. I mean, my goodness, I had been, again, I had all kinds of disappointments in my life. I'd had all these quote unquote failures. I'd had two abusive relationships. I, the ramifications for those had been immense. I'd had financial terror. I'd had things that happened. I was accustomed to my fair share of boulders. And again, I, the, as a result of that, they had pushed me in the direction of studying the inner game. And so I realized that I may not be able to control the outer game. No one could. But I sure as heck could play a mean inner game. And so I realized that if that was all I had to bring to my daughter, then game on. And this stuff was either real or it wasn't. And had I not had those hours, had that accident been like a car accident in Tampa, I probably would have rushed down to Tampa General or something and and still been in that panicky frenzy. But because I had to get up at 30,000 feet and I had time to ask myself these powerful questions, it really, I did not arrive at that little hospital as the second victim of this boulder. I was truly already at that point a force to be reckoned with. And I was ready to lead Team Skylar, which meant that this global family that her friend had now alerted and that I had alerted that Skylar had this accident. Now this global family was all believing, oh my gosh, Skylar is going to die any moment. That was not going to help her survive beyond this. So I had to shift it which is what the posts on Facebook ended up being, why they're in a book right now, because people 
it started sharing them and passing them along. And so that began to really shift everything for us. And by the time we were able to fly her to Miami, some impossibilities had already taken place. That answers your Miami question. Yeah. So then we flew her to Miami to Jackson Memorial, which is where the majority of the procedures took place. And the doctors there are really considered the Olympians of kind of neurosurgery and and trauma. And so even they were so surprised to see what happened that they ended up calling us the Miracle Family. I said that I've been on a Friday and I was enlisted to Miami on Monday. Wow. Yeah. 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 It was amazing. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. They have to fly at sea level because of the pressure. But yes. So initially they had thought. So here's the thing about Columbia. Most hospitals do not have an ICU. They are all privately owned. So fortunately, Skyler was in one with an ICU. So originally, they thought that maybe they would fly her because the facility would be better in Bogota. But there was the elevation that would add to the pressure on her brain. So she, the miracle started almost immediately. The little ICU happened to be located in a town where the former professor of neurosurgery from University of Bogota had retired because there were so many motorcycle accidents there. So he was there to help. But then they actually ignored some recommendations that they had gotten because, again, Columbia isn't uh, doesn't answer to the HIPAA. Qualification. So they reached out to this big neurosurgery conference that was going on and was circulating all the x rays and CAT scans of Skylar. And some of the highly esteemed neurosurgeons in the US said, no, you need to take radical action and basically chop off a part of her brain to prevent the swelling, which would have been irreversible. They chose not to do that. And within 48 hours, her the swelling had re- reduced to what you might expect in two or three weeks. So we were able at that point, rather than to consider flying her to Bogota, to find an airplane, that an air ambulance that would airlift her to Miami which is what we ended up doing. And she went through many procedures there. I told it on the plane. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. It was terrifying. It was terrifying. And it must have had great air paramedics. Oh, yeah. uh, To to bring you back and get you over to Miami as, as, as safely as they did. Now, as she's, well, when she was in the air, the air ambulance, the helicopter or yeah. the plane, was she still in a medically induced coma at that point? Yeah. She... And okay. in fact, that was so part of the crazy issue was that, first of all, in the ambulance that drove the four hours from Socorro back to Bucaramanga, which is where the air ambulance could land, the roads in are all switched back. And so literally every 20 minutes, we would have to stop because her head would be banging against the top. They had limited amount of oxygen and no doctor in the ambulance with us. So what they hadn't been told was that she had that fracture in her spine. So meanwhile, she's getting banged up against the top of the hospital, I mean, of the ambulance. And so what is remarkable, another miracle was that with the broken bones, it didn't nick her spinal cord and paralyze her, which they, when we got her to Miami, they one technician slightly bumped into her bed, which in, was one of those rocking beds. Wilson before, bed. Yes, before she had the procedure to repair it. And one of the nurses just about bit his head off. That's how fragile it was. And yet it endured that. 
But when we got to Bukmaranga, just out of protocol, all first of all, the Colombian team did not speak English. The American team had one person who could speak English, but they had to completely disconnect on the tarmac. So it took 45 minutes in the heat with a limited amount of oxygen to disconnect all of the Colombian equipment, except for that which was physically embedded in her, and reconnect with American equipment and then get her back up this tiny little thing. So it was it was formidable. It was formidable. So absolutely, yes, the air ambulance team was unbelievable. Really unbelievable. Hey, What's going through your mind through this ambulance ride? What is what's going on with you? I know it's I know, I mean, obviously Mama Bear is yeah. there, right? Yeah. But oh, yeah. what's going through your head? So I mean, so we are in so one of the angels ended up being a woman who became like my sister, who actually lives here in Tarpon Springs, duh. And so she was from Colombia, she and her husband. So she became almost like the interpreter. So we are on the phone with her, who's on the phone with the owner of the ambulance, telling, trying to tell the ambulance driver to slow down, stop, because they would speed and brake and speed and brake. And, and also, there's zero visibility as you go around these corners, these switchbacks, you just really can't see. So it was really nerve wracking. I was doing my best to stay in that really centered and aligned place, which looking back, I'm, it was remarkable how I was able to do that. It was totally, it speaks to, sometimes we have, I think we have a tendency to not always Maybe I don't know whether it's believing that epic part of us exists when we're, well, let me put it this way. Sometimes I think we accomplish things that are epic, not because we believe it's possible, but because someone that we love or someone that we know is invested in the outcome or thinks that we can and we don't want to let them down. And so that became my personal call to action was this is. My daughter's life, literally, if this works, which supposedly going back thousands of years, this these laws of the inner game are valid. And if they are, then I am going to play them like I have never played them before. And so I really got into this zone of a knowing and I absolutely became the sovereign of my own mind and would not allow my mind to go to entertain the possibility that this was going to be anything other than fine, whatever the new fine was destined to look like. And so that is what I think really kept me in a place that ended up energizing those around me even. It became infectious. That's amazing. So basically what you're saying is that sometimes you become epic or doing some, let's just say what it is, doing some epic shit, not out of necessity, because somebody's counting on you. Yes. And we can far recede. And then we actually, it's really interesting because I talked about my, I talked to my kids today. My, when I say my kids, it's the Tampa Catholic track and field team about the edge. You find that edge. And yeah. we all think that there's an edge there of what we can do, what we're capable of and everything else. And then out of necessity, you exceed it far beyond what you ever believed is possible. And it sounds like you were able to go into a headspace where you said, I have no choice, yes. but do some epic shit for yeah. my daughter. Excuse my language, but I mean, yeah. talk about that is just over and above what maybe you thought was possible. Absolutely. 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 And and kind of to your point, I even went back to some of the energy training that I had in my 20s, 
that my kids had never seen because I was so busy being super mom, single mom, that, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, j- just no, it was not in the vocabulary. Plus, my son is like this budding accountant. He was not that kind of stuff would be like very woo woo to him. Well, with Skylar, I was like, I don't care if anyone thinks that I'm absolutely crazy. And I was convinced when I started creating the posts that were very inner game that people would think, oh my gosh, poor Skylar. She has this delirious mom who is so freaking out of touch. I was terrified. But I was like, I don't care if people think I'm crazy. This is what how I believe I need to play this game to win. So what became really interesting for my kids is that I one of the times I used a pendulum crystal. And so this was in Miami and Sky's in a coma. Her eyes are completely taped shut. She there's no way that she knows what's going on unless you're maybe uh, unless I was like holding her hand and asking her very specific questions loudly to squeeze. I was not. She was lying there and I closed my eyes and I focused my energy onto her as I just allowed the crystal, the pendulum to guide me to where I sensed it needed to go. The, The other two kids are watching and they became believers because every time that the crystal would go over a place of a part of her body that was injured, it would start spinning and really then kind of like hone. It would start moving and that part of her body without me touching it would start moving. And so it was a really profound experience for her. We had so many like, experiences that are not able to be explained, Brad. It was like uncanny. And it got to the point where numerous times the doctors would pull me into the nurse's station and point at something like on the CAT scan and say, I know you don't know what you're looking at, but I just have to show you this because what you are looking at is the CAT scan of someone who either does not make it or who is vegetative. And clearly your daughter in there is neither one of those. This is what you were seeing is a medical impossibility here. But And if it was any other family, we would believe that there was some sort of error with the machine. Yeah. So it was amazing to be a part of. And what was even more amazing was that I got to the point where I held that alignment so intensely that it began radiating out and it was, it became almost like embracing the entire ICU while we were there. It was fascinating. And the nurses were talking about it. The other patients' families were talking about it. It was really interesting and just reinforced to me what the potential we have as human beings When we really, and that's why I do what I do today, why I'm so passionate, because I've seen the potential. I consider myself more than a transformational coach, a potential amplifier to help people identify, then clean up what's in the way, and then realize how to unleash it, how to direct it. Because were we all to really learn, which we're never trained to do, how to become the sovereign of our own mind, the potential. I mean, we saw with just kind of, I was focused on doing that, but imagine if you had an an entire community doing this and much less an entire planet where we were doing this. And yeah. So, you know what, it's so interesting that you said, and it sparked something in me when I was, when you were saying this, it's so interesting. So I've spent a lot of time in the healthcare field as well. And because of that and military and everything else, I've been to a lot of funerals, unfortunately. But I will say there's been a lot of times where it's like the viewing 
and you go in, you see it. But basically, everybody's in a church or a synagogue or in a room, and all they're doing is sitting there. They've gone, they've paid their respects, they've come back, and they've just sat. Sometimes they're reading a Bible, sometimes they're saying that, but most of the time they're just sitting there. And the energy that's radiating, and I've always thought about it, and I never could put a could put words to it until you just did. But I remember being, and especially one, it was a child who had cancer and unfortunately succumbed. But the parents were there and went through the receiving line, gave paid my respects, and then everybody just sat down in the church. That was it. But the amount of energy that was going in, the I remember talking to the parents later, and she's saying that she could feel it. She could feel this love. And when she had thought maybe that it was her son, I think it was more about people like giving them their essence to help her heal going forward. And I think that's kind of what you're explaining. Yes. Yes. And it was fascinating. For example, there were two moments that were really memorable for me. One was this, I think, Haitian or Jamaican family that that came in and clearly it was their father who had been in a motorcycle accident. And when the shifts of the nurses changed, everybody had to leave the the patient's room and allow the, the nurses to do what they needed to do. So we were in this teeny tiny little waiting room if you wanted to stay on that same floor. And I, that particular, I didn't usually, but for whatever reason, that particular evening I did. And I went in there and the only other people was this family and they were wailing. And there was a 16 year old girl that kind of isolated herself from the rest of the family. And she was sitting very close to me and I could feel her distress. And so I ask her if I could hug her and hold her. And she said yes. And she just kind of started weeping in my arms. And I looked at her and I said something along the lines of, I am here with you as testimonials that miracles do happen. My daughter is in there and she has survived the unsurvivable. You need to be the beacon of hope for your family. You go in there. You see beyond whatever has happened to your father. Miracles are happening every single day. You be that beacon. You go in there. And I could see, it was weird. I could see the grief kind of roll off of her and be replaced with resolve. And again, with her family, she became the beacon. And they came up to me on other days when we would see each other and really say, thank you so much. And her, their father also had this miraculous sort of recovery. And it really was amazing to experience how infectious that could be and how capable we are, are make, of making that shift when we give our mind very clear guidance of where we want it to go and who we want to show up being. I have a, another saying that we cannot miss the boat because we are the boat, but we do have to learn how to captain it. And the how well we learn to captain it really determines the kind of experience we have as we're crossing the ocean. That's powerful stuff. And I imagine that was starting to be the seeds that were getting planted for what you ended up doing yeah. with, with Grit Mindset Academy. So how long was Skylar in, in Miami? So for four months, Sky was there. And it was just about Mother's Day. Well, slightly afterwards, when she got out of when she was officially released, we stayed for one more month and waited until the beginning of July to come back to Tampa so that she could still be in the same environment. I trusted that team implicitly to begin her 
rehab therapy um, because she had really gone down to about 92 pounds at the time. So she, she was a, a rail, a rail. And again, she could barely swallow. She had a, a brace around because of the spinal cord injury. She could barely talk. She could not raise her arms. She could, like I said, she could not sit unattended. She definitely couldn't stand or walk or anything like that. So, so yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it gets better and better. So, so update on her physical progress so far is she has once again defied all odds and cannot walk so low yet, although caveat on that, <laughs> with a walker that has kind of the arm pedestals, I can. Yes. If someone is yes. following her, like right behind her, shadowing her in case, because the the biggest damage really, it's not that she has a spinal cord injury. It's the balance and in, in the impact onto her head. So, so that's what she is still fearlessly uh-huh. tackling and just, it keeps blowing through impossibilities uh-huh. and doing remarkable things. So, All right. Well, today you're in a walk, you're walking with our pads and the whole bit. Another year from now, you're going to be on that start line at Gasparilla <laughs> and running it. So... <laughs> that's gonna be amazing yeah next time man, it's in, anytime you want to go back to gasparilla i'm pushing and screw the little 5k let's do the 15 Whoa. You know? yeah that's that part is. Walking. <laughs> it's a, i'm sitting <laughs> yeah. well yeah but if you ever want to if you get i'm pushing i'm all over it i'm all that right. is i would be honored more than earlier right. hey, we've got the iron man uh you yeah, know. I'd be all over it. But yeah. <laughs> so so let, let's just step back just one second. And as we come to a close here, Meredith, what would you give? What kind of advice would you give? Maybe a step-by-step plan mm-hmm. on somebody who's gone through something like this and they feel like it's the end of it. You, there's nothing they can do. They felt that powerlessness that you felt. Right. And you were able to go above it, which that in itself was a miracle. Well, right. what would somebody that's in, in somewhat of the same situation and they're feeling that powerlessness, what would be the, some right. of the steps that you would take that you would help them take moving forward? Perfect. That's a great question. I'm going to have a prelude to that question, though. If you are listening to this podcast and you do not have a boulder dropping in your life, you do not have any big challenge right now, but you do have potentially some dreams that you would like to have be big dreams, or you're just a human being who is having a life experience right now. Now is the time to realize that, in my humble opinion, we have one goal and one goal only, and that is to be taking our last breath whenever that is. We have no idea, clearly. Looking back, saying, oh my God, that was freaking epic. I hope I have the chance to do this again. And the way we get there is by learning to play our inner game to win. It is not just in our tragedies when this becomes important. If we are to experience that sense of having fully lived, coming, waking up the day, feeling exuberant and fully alive, it begins in the inner game. If you want to believe that your skies have no limit, it begins in the inner game. Our minds crave guidance. And if we do not give our minds guidance, it will look for guidance elsewhere. And that's when it can shift onto autopilot and we start feeling like we are stuck or that we don't even know who we are. So what I'm saying is if you really want to feel like you have fully lived, it it doesn't take a boulder to say now is the time to go into your inner game. So how does that begin for all of us, whether you're in the middle of an insurmountable obstacle right now or whether you are just waking up saying, oh, my gosh, I will never live this moment again. To me, there, this is what the 100 Days of Epic is based on. 
these three elements. It really comes down to the mastery of three elements in your inner game. One is your focus. And so, so I'll, I'll, so one is your focus, one is your language, and one is your imagination. So focus means understanding not only where you are, but who you are. And because you are not the same as you were even yesterday. So it's really starting to come into to touch with that. And there, of course, many of you who are listening to this may have heard that what you focus on expand. That's fine, except most of us believe that we're focusing on what we want when actually we're focusing on the presence, the lack of the presence of what we want. So the exact opposite. So that is why for most people, if let's say there are two of us in a coffee shop and you were to ask me, where do I want to be a year from now? I would believe I was talking about what I want by saying, oh my gosh, Brad, a year from now, oh, I want to grow my business. I want to be doing something that I'm passionate about. I want to be out of this scenario where I'm feeling such grief and such pressure. Most people would feel that they were talking about what they want. And yet, if you notice the emotional frequency of that, it's very heavy. And the reason it's heavy is because we're focusing on the lack of the presence versus, oh my gosh, a year from now, I intend to be freaking on fire. I'm going to wake up knowing my impact, growing, loving the challenges that I encounter and blah, 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 blah. It's that focusing more on feeling and by really getting in touch with the feeling, your mind gets the programming and goes, oh, I see the guidance. I see what you want. Okay, let's go get it, right? So focus number one, two, your language. If you walk around all day long using the phrases that have the invisible stories that keep you small, you will stay small. And what does that look like? Oh, God, the, the problem right now is that I just, I just, I always end up not being able to finish or I just can't find the confidence. I mean, I've done well in my life, but, 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 but it's those phrases. And if you notice, one of the most self sabotaging practices that we have is to be unaware of our present tense statements. Our present tense statements always reflect what we believe to be truth. And so therefore, when we walk around saying my biggest challenge is we are creating programming code again for that subconscious. However, we do have to believe it. So I'm not advocating going into the mirror and say, I am a money magnet only to have your mind say, have you checked your bank account recently? Right? It's it has to be believable, but don't assume that there's only ver one variation of truth. It's also true to say my biggest commitment right now is to find the confidence that is going to help me go on and really get beyond this bump in the road right now, etc. It's my biggest opportunity. I'm excited to overcome this, right? It's those kind of phrases that start feeling things bubbling. And the third thing is your imagination. As adults, we tend to use it only to fear, to worry, or to doubt. And that allows, that I mean, that allows us to mistake fear for danger. Nine times out of 10, we are not in danger. We have not jumped out of a plane with no parachute. We are creating a story about something that has not happened yet. Chances are will never happen. Were it to happen, probably won't end up quite as badly as we imagine. So were we to get in the practice of envisioning the possibility and envisioning beyond the obstacle and do that for our teams, for our children, to be able to be the beacon beyond that, then really the sky, you could, that's where you get into the place where the sky has no limit and where the impossible shifts quite easily into the I am possible. So it all begins with the inner game and really paying attention to 
what you're focusing on and what you're making it mean, what kind of inner narrative you are making your reality, because that is how you will experience your reality. And then finally, how you are using this huge resource that we have, our imagination. In other words, our ability to envision, because the imagination is what has the capability of getting us to that inner frequency that magnetically aligns with the things that bring us joy, bring us happiness. We have to be an emotional uh, frequency, the same alignment in order for that to show up in our life. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Oh my God. Amazing stuff right there, everybody. So listen, so basically what Meredith is saying that if you're in this position where you're stuck or you're trying to get over an obstacle and adversity, all you need to do is focus on flying. F for focus. L is your language and your imagination. So you just need to fly. Yes. And then the sky's the limit. Or so, the limit is sometimes just the beginning. Right. So, so <laughs> yeah, so definitely. So the Grit Mindset Academy, gritmindsetacademy.com. I'm going to link that in the show notes for you. And that's where you can have a 20-minute call with Meredith and you'll be able to get some of these answers. And if you find ways to get unstuck and then then have have a good conversation. And if you're lucky, you'll get to meet Skylar. <laughs> um, but only if you're lucky, like I was today. And it's, she's, a, as you can see, and as you can hear, she's an incredible, the both of them are incredible people. And I would definitely take a look at Grit Mindset Academy. I'll also link to her, her books, The Sky's the Limit and 100 Days of Epic. Well, that'll be right there in the show notes for you. So pick those up, give those a little, give those a read. And I just want to say to both of you, it has been such a pleasure. And I hope we get to do this again. Absolutely. We, 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 next time we'll be able to dig a little bit deeper into mindset training and watch as Skylar continues to progress. And hopefully the 220, and if you guys, anyone who wants to come out to the 2025 Gasparilla weekend, distance weekend and, and watch me and Skylar cross the finish line, uh, you're more than welcome to. So, so yeah, so definitely. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. I, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much Frank, for having us. And if you are listening to this, make sure you subscribe to his podcast because this is so cool. And this kind of stuff, just this is truly how you soar. So Brad, thank you for doing this podcast and specifically for having us on board here. Oh, no, it might, but it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Listen, until next time, remember to spark desire and incinerate your limits. <laughs> well, that wraps up another episode of Life Changing Challengers. I'm your host, Brad Minus, saying thank you for joining us on this journey of transformation. If today's story has inspired you, please take a moment to review, share, and follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Your support helps us reach more listeners and creating an even bigger impact. Remember, every challenge is a chance to grow. Until next time, keep pushing, keep challenging, and never stop pursuing your extraordinary.